We're excited about growing this. It's going to fit within our 50-foot buffer here for the for our stream. And um, in Jeffersonville, John Hayden like is showing off so his aronia, also known as black chokeberry. And we'll... Hayden and his wife Nancy own the farm between. They have been farming this land for over 20 years and in the last few years have expanded into growing a variety of fruits. And we've evolved more recently in the past seven years or so to be growing mostly perennial fruit. So we grow a whole slew of fruits from apples, blueberries, strawberries, and the very common fruit that everybody enjoys to some more alternative fruits like elderberries, black currants, hascap, saskatoons. And um, we sell them fresh, and we also sell them uh, with, as value-added products and jams and syrups. Hayden had dabbled in growing fruit before, but it was the idea of making the value-added products that got him experimenting. And that just opened the gates for me to be able to grow small patches of really interesting fruits. He's been growing aronia for a couple of years, making sure it does well and works as a syrup. He planted a full row of it this year to test it on a larger scale and see if there's a market for it among their customers. But that's not the only reason Hayden is trying out this new plant. We've had severe floods here three times, once in 1995 and then two times in uh, 2011. So that spring and then we had Irene and there were two, both floods were about equally as bad for us, kind of in the barn, you know, this is the knee deep in the barn, in our farm stand and stuff like that and um, flooded our crops and we lost crops and uh, that was like kind of the eye opener for us. You know, Vermont has always experienced what was typically called spring flooding. Ginger Nickerson works for the University of Vermont rate. Extension's Center for Sustainable Agriculture. What we've been seeing more recently is wetter springs, sometimes um, more intense rainfalls, so um, more flooding either because we're getting more rain or more intense rain. After Irene, there were subsequent recommendations from the FDA to not replant in soil that had been flooded for at least 60 days. That led to a flood of farmers calling for advice. Most farms knew that they wouldn't be able to sell food where the edible part had come in contact with floodwaters. What surfaced after Irene was this more recent um, guideline or recommendation from the FDA about not replanting for 60 days afterwards. And so that's when farmers learned about that, that's when they started contacting Extension and asking us, you know, well, what could we plant instead? Mm -hmm. Farmers and researchers around the state began to look into whether it would be possible to extend riparian zones with something that would be both economically and environmentally viable. You would have the buffer that's along the river stream for conservation purposes that is left alone. These harvestable crops would be planted between the conservation buffer and your production field, but within the areas that can get impacted by flooding, but still provide the farm a harvestable product for either on-farm inputs or commercial sale. The agricultural community is critical to flood resiliency because it maintains these floodplains for us. Marley Roop is an agricultural water quality specialist for the state. She says that thinking about growing crops in riparian zones is new for the state, but worth looking into. The biggest concern is maintaining the integrity of buffer zones. Buffers by definition, both in state statute and in most of the research literature, are a perennial vegetated area that's undisturbed, that's, that's not managed. And when we look at buffers, we don't necessarily want to manage them too much. When we're looking at flood resiliency, protection from flooding, it's important to let the buffers be as they are and leave the trees and shrubs growing there because it does help control the soil and the erosion. Farmers are regulated by the state to have a 10 to 25 foot buffer around any water on their property. If planting perennial crops in adjacent areas proves successful, the hope is that more farmers would be encouraged to expand their buffers further into these low maintenance, low impact areas. If we protect the floodplain and give the river room to move, 
the effects of flooding on towns downstream and farms downstream are decreased. So Liz really Brownlee has uh, been working with a number of farms around the well. state, testing different plants and growing scenarios. We want to have good data from Vermont that says these buffers are protecting our drinking water. And we want to have good data that says it's, uh, that these buffers are holding stream banks in place. And then on the economic side of it, we need to know, you know can a farmer make money from this? Um, we don't want to suggest it as a strategy if it's not a winning strategy. This could be flooded for a day or two, and um, you know, there'll be no harm. It does well in wet situations. At the farm between, the Hiddens spent years letting the vegetation around the stream on their property grow undisturbed. And now, they have no regrets about their decision to extend that buffer. So this past spring, we had some huge flash flooding here. The area that we're standing on right now was basically a 30-foot wide river, and I uh, washed out my irrigation system, and uh, the field we're standing in behind you, we used to plant corn or potatoes or beans, you know, annual crops in there. And if we had done that this past year, half that field would be in Lake Champlain now. It's not all fruits and berries. Farmers around the state have been experimenting with plants that do better in wetter conditions. They don't require as much maintenance and can be used around the farm or turned into value-added products. So the types of things that we're looking at now in terms of the on-farm benefits are woody perennials for, um, for biomass production that could be used for heating uh, greenhouses or chicken houses. Some, like Hayden, are turning small branches from their woody perennials into a nutrient-rich type of mulch called vermeil. So we're cutting our box elders, our birches, silver maples that all do great in wetland areas, and chipping them and using them as a fertilizer on our crops, and that's been working out really well. Nickerson cautions that even if it proves successful to grow crops around riparian zones, it's not going to be a solution for every piece of land. Rivers are dynamic, they're almost like living creatures, and there are parts of their beds where they are going to want to scour and move. And in those places, it doesn't make economic sense for a landowner or a farmer to make a long-term investment. The hope is that this is just one of many tools that Vermont farmers are putting into place when we're thinking about climate change and, and flood resiliency as well. Ongoing research with the potential to help Vermont farms become more flood resilient and more profitable. It's an idea so new, it doesn't even have a name. In Jeffersonville, I'm Rebecca Gollin with Across the Fence.